So it happened in July of 1944, so it's celebrating a major anniversary right now. It's the, Hark- the Hartford Circus Fire, which is, you know, before the, in some ways, before there was a new town, before there was a 9-11, there was this tragedy, which marked people around here in so many different ways, uh, changed uh, aspects of, of the way we live uh, here in Connecticut for many decades. But it's maybe a story that not that many people know all that well. And so on on this uh, time of a major anniversary, we, we thought we'd pull together some people who know a lot about it. It's interesting in the way it affects imaginations. Many books have been written about it, both fiction and nonfiction. We discovered, or Wolfie discovered, pulling the show together today, a lot of music has been written about it as well. It has some of the elements, I think, that ignite the imagination. So uh, today joining us in studio, Gary Payne is the national president-elect of the Circus Fans Association of America, which was formed in 1926. Marianne Tyrone Smith, uh, she's the author of many, many, many novels, starting with The Book of Phoebe. That was the first one, right? Yes, it was, 1985. Uh, and, uh, And pretty soon... Uh, to include, how many books have you written? Do you actually know how many books you've written? Ten. Ten. All right. Well, pertinently for today, uh, of course, Mary Ann Tyron Smith, the author of Masters of Illusion, a novel of the Connecticut Circus Fire. Also with us on the phone from the West Coast, Don Massey, the author and screenwriter of A Matter of Degree uh, and a member of the Circus Fire Memorial Committee. Gary Payne, I'm just going to have you start us off here. What happened in July of 1944? As starkly as you can, just sort of state the facts of the Hartford Circus Fire. Well, imagine, if you would, uh, Disneyland coming to your town for just a couple of days, which is the way you looked at the circus back in 1944. And uh, Ringley Brothers and Barnum & Bailey, the greatest show on earth, came to town for two days only. And uh, imagine as many souls in the big top as you would put into a building, for example, in Connecticut, the size of Harbor Yard in Bridgeport or the size of the Mohegan Sun Arena. That's approximately the capacity of the big top back on July 6th, 1944. And imagine all of that vaporized in 10 minutes, almost exactly. 169 souls lost and uh, six or 700 people injured. Don Massey, you know, he gave the number 169. I feel as though when I read about this, I read everything from 167 to 170. Does there, anybody really know absolutely for sure how many people died at the Hartford Circus Fire? The answer to that question is there have been multiple reports with different numbers attendant to each. Rick, Davey, and I have long held the opinion, we believe certifiable evidence, that the total number is 168, with all due respect to Gary. The rationale for that assertion is found in a public document created by one of the uh, key medical examiners on site at the time. That compilation listed 168 dead to include the little-known fact that an infant labeled Child 001 was crushed by a falling tent pole, he or she becoming the 168th victim. You know, as we go along here, we're going to talk a lot about the facts of the case, what's known, what's not known, what our guests believe to be the case. Uh, But we're also going to talk, as I said, about how the story exists in memory, collective memory and imagination. Mary and Tyrone Smith, uh, you're here with us today. You were, I think, a baby uh, being put down for a nap in 1944. My my mother put me outside, actually, in my carriage for a nap because that's when we thought sun was good for everyone, even babies. And within a few minutes, she heard a siren and then another siren. And pretty soon it was nothing but sirens. And somebody ran outside from and all she could think of was the baby's going to wake up, you know, and she picks me up. Of course, it did wake me up. And the neighbor came running over and said, it's got to be the Luftwaffe. He was convinced we were being invaded by Germany. And then someone else came along and she had radio on another station and she said the circus tent is on fire. Within minutes of that, my uncle, the fireman, called my mother, and he said, we didn't get there in time to see it standing. When we got there minutes later, it was nothing but one tent pole, and that eventually fell over, and he was hysterical. Gary Payne, uh, you just heard her describe, and you described how fast this happened. Uh, You also heard her talk about the Luftwaffe. This is uh, in the middle of and towards the the tail end of World War II. Those things are not unconnected, right? There's a reason why this tent burned so fast, and it has something to do with World War II. Yes. uh, The fireproofing compound that the circus would have been using was not present. 
You have to understand also that that compound was fairly new. It had only been used a couple of times. It was mistrusted. I know that uh, at that time they didn't really believe that it was all that effective. So the uh, fireproofing compound being absent was not very unusual. Every circus on the road at that time was using a mixture of paraffin on their tents to weatherproof. Um, you know, later on in the show, we'll talk about a, a thousand different things that changed as a result of the Hartford Circus Fire. This was one of them, right? Yes, that's right. Shortly after the fire, the uh, federal government released all the fireproofing compound you wanted to use. Don Massey, this event seemed to have so many mysteries that went along with it. Uh, so many, and in fact, for someone like Marianne Tyrone Smith writing a book about this, and her, her book is fiction. It's about a guy not unlike, in some ways, Rick Davey, uh, the guy that you collaborated with, uh, about a fire investigator trying to figure this out, and, and in so doing, talking to so many people who were there and hearing their stories. But there are two mysteries that endure. Uh, one of them is who did this, or, or was it arson, or was it uh, an accident? And the other one being the long-disputed uh, identity of a body known as Little Miss 1565. Let's park that first question for a second, but tell us about Little Miss 1565. Let me predicate this by posing an assertion of my own. I believe that this is really great grounds for myth-making, and uh, we are, as a species, I would assert, uh, more inclined to perpetuate mystery than to resolve it. Uh, the assertions that are easily dispelled, in my opinion, by the existing documentary evidence, not the least of which is found in the appendix of our book. That appendix includes a two-page report from a very, very diligent Connecticut State Trooper named Samuel Freeman. He was diligent in his effort to seek the child who was missing, her name was Eleanor Emily Cook. That two-page report compiles the effort to identify the child, and also it puts to bed all of the assertions which combine over all these 70 years to become the assertion of misidentity. It clarifies the number of permanent teeth, it clarifies the clothes worn, and it clarifies how it was that a medical examiner came to conclude, along with four other officials, that the child known in the morgue as Little Miss 1565 was indeed, and to our assertion, still is, Eleanor Emily Cook. You know, uh, Mary and Tyrone Smith, uh, I think uh, your novel, Masters of Illusion, came out about 10 years ago, I think on the, one of the last anniversaries. Uh, 20. Or 20 years ago, <laughs> fifth, the 50th anniversary of, of the Hark Hartford Circus Fire. Little Miss 1565, such a symbol of this fire in some ways, um, this rather perfectly preserved, I mean, sort of maybe less damaged by the fire to her face uh, than, than many of the other people who, who died in the fire, and also just all of the questions that surrounded her identity. So you built on that a little bit, right? You used the idea of her and fictionalized it. I did. I didn't fictionalize a lot of this book. It happened. It was history. It happened around me. And the little miss died of compression on injuries, my understanding, so that her face was a little singed, but she was very clear picture of her. And, you know, her brother of the three children, he survived the fire. As soon as he was shown this picture, he said, that's my sister, mm -hmm. period. And he knew it. Who, who else but him would know it. The mother was so badly injured, it was months before she saw this picture. So um, that's my feeling. But there's a way in which she symbolizes so much about this story, right? Why, why does this disaster have the kind of hold on us that it has? Well, most of the people, the victims were women and children, their mm. fathers and grandfathers even, and uncles, they're all fighting the war. You know, you go to a fire for the thrills, but the, the thrills, the, the circus, I'm so. sorry, you go to the circus for these thrills and chills, but the thrills and chills are happening to, you're getting them from the performers. Mm -hmm. So now you're suddenly in this huge danger. So everybody can, can really identified with this. You know, you go to the circus and you have fun, you get excited, but all these people, almost all women and children, were the ones who died, and there were many legends, and one of them, the, my mother would swear to it, there was a woman who had the thumbprint of a soldier in her back. Now, the soldiers on leave from Brainerd Field, 
most of them were so young, they didn't go to the local gin mill. They came to the circus, and they saved a lot of people by picking them up over the crowd. And the story is probably true. What would happen in the human, being, the human being's mind if, in fact, this lovely child, this gorgeous, largely intact, largely unimpeded face, except for, as Marianne rightly states, a compression injury that ultimately claimed her life. She was a visible, gorgeous symbol of the childhood innocence that was robbed from so many children. Five times as many children below the age of 15 then would subsequently die in Oklahoma City. And yet, here she was, and what happens if she's identified? For a lot of people, it would put the controversy and the mystery to bed. But in reality, she was identified repeatedly by officials in the city of Hartford, police officers, Mrs. Brodigan, the social worker who treated her at Municipal Hospital before her death, and the medical examiner herself. Ultimately, years later in 1991, when Little Miss 1565 was exhumed from her resting place for 50 years, her skull fell apart and the four upper permanent teeth and four permanent lower teeth, which had been and continue to be an allegation uh, of misidentity, were present, just as Dr. Weissenborn had declared. Only three people were present at the time of exhumation, one of whom was Rick Davey. So, it is a source of frustration for us in attempting, as we have, to put forward facts which are not only credible, but certifiable. Once again, just for, if you're just tuning in, we're talking about the circus fire of July 6, 1944 in Hartford. Maybe you could say what, it, what the misidentification was. In other words, you and, and Lieutenant Rick Davey um, have gone on to sort of to verify and to show these documents uh, indicating that, uh, that it is, in fact, Eleanor Cook, uh, who was from, the, I think, the Northampton area of Massachusetts. What was the misidentification? Who were they saying that this body was? As Marianne herself has indicated, Mom, Mildred Cook, uh, whom we assert is Mom, was very, very badly injured and in a medically induced coma in the days and weeks subsequent to the fire. What most people do not know is that this family was a family torn apart by strife. Dad had abandoned the family. Mom had no money to raise her three children in an appropriate fashion. She left East Hampton, Mass. to come to Hartford to uh, live on her own, work at Liberty Mutual in the uh, effort to raise enough money to be reunited with her children, whom she left with her brother and sister to raise independent of her in Southampton. This goes to your question. I'll begin with the clothing. No one other than the family, specifically mom and three children, knew that they were living only with her and no other family member in the days leading up to July 6th. As a special treat, Mildred went out and bought all new clothes for the children. In the absence of anyone seeing those clothes, only mom and the kids knew what the clothes were. But I go back to page two of Freeman's report, wherein he it stipulates that Mrs. Brodigan, the social worker, treating uh, little Eleanor at the time, said the clothes that were there with the body were exactly the same clothes worn by Eleanor when she presented at the hospital. But when the um, controversy arises, it's always about misidentity because it, the identification was actually left to a family member, Eleanor's aunt, Emily, who was, again, reported in page two of Freeman's report, declared to have been incompetent to identify the body because she made claims which were medically and anatomically impossible. So the problem partly was that the family said that that couldn't be Eleanor, right? Indeed. And again, to your point, 2,000 degree heat, if I may amplify, uh, will alter a human body, I say with understatement. That body, which is not incinerated, uh, will find its cartilage shrinking, nose, ears, and so forth. Uh, someone you love and know in your life 
may actually become unidentifiable because of that heat-related shrinkage. But don't you think, if I can interrupt you, that um, the aunt wanted to protect her sister and said, no, that that child wasn't Eleanor. Some wonderful family somewhere has found her, is taking care of her. Talk about believe what you want to believe. I think the aunt even believed that. Actually, that's a wonderful point. It it is mentioned in the book because the family was a New England Yankee family. They circled the emotional wagons and concealed uh, what they perceived to be the truth from Mildred for years and years and years. But this was a horrific moment for Emily Gill, the aunt. She came to the Hartford morgue brought by Trooper Freeman to see again the same body she saw at the armory uh, the day before. But when she made a declaration that her niece had eight permanent teeth, anatomically that means eight upper teeth that she asserted were permanent, would by symmetry and human anatomy require eight permanent lower teeth, which no dentist or pediatrician would ever say is possible in an eight-year-old. Not that I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but we can get a little bit uh, in the weeds with all this. Gary Payne, one of the things that arose out of all this was a fundamental question about whether the circus was a safe place to be. Uh, And we didn't have circuses in Hartford for decades and decades after that because of the traumatic scarring and scarring the the, the way that it it scarred our collective psyche, but also because I think people just sort of thought it wasn't safe. You know, as you look at this and as you look at this particular event, I mean, inevitably, whenever we look at a disaster, we look and we say, wow, this could have been avoided. That could have been avoided. Those people didn't have to die. That didn't have to go wrong. I mean, even if there was going to be a fire, right, just because of the way things shook out on that day. A lot of people perished or were badly injured who didn't need to be? Uh, Yes, absolutely. I mean, we can look at this the same way as we look at the Titanic. Uh, You know, it doesn't seem logical to me that I would get on a cruise ship that doesn't have enough lifeboats in the event of some sort of an emergency. And I think the analogy is applicable to the circus fire. Um, There hadn't been any accidents of this nature involving the public for a good many uh, decades, nothing on, of this magnitude, and so uh, no one saw the need uh, for an inspection that day. Um, there are other other things that we can talk about as we go along here. Let me grab a quick break here. We'll come back. We're talking about the Hartford Circus Fire. We've got a lot more to say. Stay with us. Weren't you there when the carousel burnt down? The fire and confusion, the smoke and the sound. I swear We're talking about the Hartford Circus Fire. It was 70 years ago, July 6th, 1944. With us by phone, Don Massey is the author of A Matter of Degree and a member of the Circus Fire Memorial Committee. With us in studio, Gary Payne is the national president-elect of the Circus Fans Association of America, formed in 1926. Marianne Tyrone Smith is the author of many books, including Masters of Illusion, a novel of the Connecticut Circus Fire. Marianne Don Massey just uh, told us uh, a story in the previous segment about the the sort of complicated chain of custody for this little girl, things that had gone on in the family, the fact that the the father wasn't around. And in many ways, your novel is about this kind of thing, too, right? This is a situation where, um, and we see this with other disasters, when there's a mass tragedy, people's secrets either come out or confound our ability to understand it. People have things that they're not telling anybody, or there are things other people don't know, or somebody that morning went and bought brand new clothes for a child that nobody else could possibly know that child have had. There's something about a story like this that sort of spills over or knocks into everybody else's secrets as as we try to sort of piece the whole story together. You know, that's absolutely true. These myths and legends arise, you know, that there were all sorts of stories, like the, the soldier with the thumbprint and the woman's back. But my uncle, the fireman, when he came and talked about it, my perspective is these very personal stories. Mm -hmm. And he said, what would we have done without Hartford Hospital? Mm -hmm. Because the United States government, the War Department, decided to choose a hospital to set up what we now know as triage. 
Because if the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, what if they bombed Des Moines? Mm -hmm. And they picked Hartford Hospital out of the hat. And they set up a triage. They had sulfur drugs. They had the best of everything. And so if that hadn't happened at Hartford Hospital, we don't have any idea how many people would have died. I think a lot more considering the extent of the injuries. But then there's the other thing that became a myth that I know is true. My aunt's grandmother, who lived on Barber Street, sent all her kids and grandchildren out to every little store around to buy as many bags of potatoes as they could. And they all saw sat around the table slicing potatoes. And this is, and br- this is right in the seconds after this The seconds happened. after. I could yeah. see it happening. Yeah. So in, in those days, too, you didn't go to the hospital unless your neck was broken, you know? Mm-hmm. So these people are coming down the street asking to use phones to let their families know that they're all right. And they're covered with burns, mm-hmm. mostly from this these pieces of canvas that stuck to them. So they put these sliced potatoes on the burns, and my aunt said there were people lying all over her house, the house next door. And I since spoke to a doctor who said the cooling and moist agent of the sliced potatoes probably did really help them, kept the burns from drying up. So it's all really personal to me. Yeah, there's a a human scale to it. There is a human scale. But that's an amazing story. So one of your family members, her first instinct seeing this thing happen was Mm -hmm. to send the kids out to buy potatoes. And then is it a legend or isn't it, too? I always heard that there was no waterproofed canvas available because it was being used in the war effort. Right. And so they came up with this formula because they couldn't get any waterproof canvas. I don't know if that's... Well, Gary, you, you yeah. early basically confirmed that, right? Uh, it was the fireproofing compound that was a, a fairly new invention. Uh, the weatherproofing, uh, the, that formula had been used for decades since the circus began to show under canvas. It wasn't used just by the circus. It was used by anyone who manufactured or used a tent. One thing that you sort of said at the beginning, Gary, and, but we can't emphasize this enough. At this point, Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus, this was – the biggest show really was the greatest show on earth. This was a three block long, I think, That's correct. site. Yes. Uh, yeah. The people who were there that day performing included Emmett Kelly, who was probably the most famous cl- American clown who ever lived. Uh, the Flying Walendas, uh, all these people were actually performing there. I mean, I don't. Maybe you can give us kind of a sense how big a thing was the circus in America on the day that that particular circus came to Hartford. It was equivalent to Christmas Day and your birthday rolled into one. And businesses would alter their their hours so that everyone could go to the circus. Um, it was truly like Disneyland, come to your town. Uh, this was in the day and age before television. So the circus was a gigantic event. That big top accommodated over 10,000 people. It was the size of many football fields put together over 400 feet long and 75 feet high. A lot of people were in that tent that day, including Eunice Gork, who would go on to become lieutenant governor of Connecticut, a friend of mine. Uh, Jan Minor, who would become Madge, the Palmolive lady on uh, those very famous commercials, and the actor Charles Nelson Riley. They were all uh, there that day. They all uh, got out. They all survived. And two, I think there were something like 40, I might have the number wrong, wild animals. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just three lions in a ring that you might see in a small town. And the parade of more, animals. More like 400. 400, <laughs> 400 wild yeah. animals, yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This was huge. And, you know, when I went to the Circus Fans Association of America reunion when I was writing this book, I really wanted to tell the story of the trainer of the giant gorilla. It was Gargantua. Gargantua, that, yes. And she was there. And mm. she sat down and she's telling me all of these things that nobody knew about. She said, Emmett Kelly is the most poignant photograph of him carrying a sloshing bucket of water Mm -hmm. with this conflagration in the back and you know how how heart tugging that he would just try to put help put the fire with a bucket of water she said he's heading for his car as fast as he can because his costumes are in there they cost a lot of money and he had to wet down that wagon not car the wagon so that he wouldn't lose his costumes not that he wasn't dead inside watching Mm. this happen. Mm. But that was just another one of these kind of myths and fables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To the point you made earlier about the uh, uh, waterproofing compound, Ringling had been using it, as Gary said, for decades. It's a mixture of uh, 6,000 gallons of gasoline 
and 1,800 pounds of paraffin wax spread across a square mile of canvas that weighed 12 tons, such that when it did take flame and ultimately collapse, there was no escaping if you were still inside. And this points to many of the municipal errors that the city contributed to this event. There was no fire apparatus positioned on site. There was no inspection of the final setup of the circus. The closest fire hydrant was 300 feet from the point where such water would be needed. As if that weren't enough, the ringling fire hose couplings that they had on their own wagons did not match the three-inch couplings on the hydrants. All of these things and more could have been, should have been judged as a combined potential hazard, and this combines to be the municipal error that we assert went to an aggressive cover-up of the facts. I want to uh, talk a little bit more uh, about the the cover-up of the facts. We'll do that in the third section, uh, or or just why it's been so difficult to answer this other huge question uh, about this. Um, But just uh, just to go back to what we were talking about before, uh, Gary, uh, about the animals and the 400 animals, I think from my reading what I recall is that uh, only just maybe one or two animals were in the ring at the time uh, that the fire broke out. And that did all the animals survive? Yes, yes. No animals were uh, injured uh, on the day of the fire. The wild animal acts in ring one and ring three were just about to conclude or had concluded, and the animals were literally going through the chutes. Just um, leaving the tent. They're, yeah. It's starting to burn, and the animals are going through the chutes, mm-hmm. which blocked and, the people from getting out these yeah. chutes. And May Kovar, who was responsible that day for the wild cat act, later stated in the press that she was armed with a, with a sidearm that she reported to the press she was willing to use on those animals that would have impeded the safe egress or endangered the lives of people struggling to get over those cage shoots. She was prepared to kill the animals in order to save human life. Um, We're going to take a little break. We're talking about the uh, Hartford Circus fire. It happened 70 years ago, July 6th, uh, 1944. Uh, We'll come back after this. As a kid, I lived on Barber Street. Four blocks from that circus show And I begged my parents I got down on my knees But they would not let me go But they had grounded me For two weeks straight And I can't even remember why But I know the first time That I ever prayed Was when I saw that black smoke Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kion Wolf. Greg Hill tweets for us at WNPR Colin. Our interns are Allison Ehrenreich, Lily Tyson, Josh Nalea, Katie Pikus, and Brittany Hill. For show pages and other articles, visit our website, WNPR.org. On tomorrow's show, Rand Cooper returns to the nose after two weeks with no internet. Back to Colin. So the Hartford Circus Fire happened July 6, 1944, 70 years ago. With us uh, in studio to talk about it is Gary Payne, the national president-elect of the Circus Fans Association of America, Marianne Tyrone Smith, whose many books include Masters of Illusion, a novel of the Connecticut Circus Fire. Don Massey's on the phone with us from the West Coast. Uh, he's the author of A Matter of Degree, uh, a member and a member of the Circus Fire Memorial Committee. You know, before we get to the whole question of how this fire started, Marianne, one of the things that I think is, um, it, you know, there was no word for post-traumatic stress syndrome. That that term didn't exist back in 1944. This is 
an event that stayed with people mm-hmm. in in really really significant ways in ways I, I think that are would would be hard for us to understand if we had hadn't been through Newtown if we hadn't been through a nine eleven uh, maybe we're a little bit more familiar with it at the time but um, as you talk to people as you constructed your novel I mean that's a big part of it too right the way something like this it just it can't be washed clean uh, of our psyches just because we want it to be the circus fire became part of the character of the city of Hartford. I don't remember a week going by without talking about it, without, did you hear what so-and-so did with her money that she got from the insurance company? She bought a cottage at Indian Town in Old Saybrook. Mm. And then the character in my book, she turns 18, and she's going to be getting this money. It wouldn't seem like a lot now. It was a whole lot then. And she took the money that her parents put aside for her, and she bought this Cadillac convertible, which is why the fireman in the book, uh, the young man, notices her. And a lot of this stuff today, when we hear it today, it's Mm. absolutely astounding. But Mm. it was talked about all the time. And then we would have fire drills at school, and the teacher would bring this up. And she'd say, you know, these are Hartford people that went to that fire. They didn't know they could climb under the tent. Um, And there's the famous story of the young boy who took out his pen knife and slit the tent. And a lot of people escaped that way. And she would say to us, so if the school catches on fire, here's what we have to do. And then she'd bring up things that she learned from when the fire happened and talked about staying calm and everything. So we would hear this all the time. It was just part of the community, and it became part of the character of the city. And Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey came back on the 50th anniversary, and for the first time, a tent is going to be set up in Hartford, any kind of tent. Mm -hmm. And they had their performance, and everything was wonderful, thank goodness. And this guy was interviewed the next day. He said, we're never coming back again. He said, the cloud of that fire was sitting on our tent. We just couldn't perform to the best of our ability. We couldn't get it out of our heads. They had a circus every year in Mm. Hartford. It was Shriner Circus, and it was at the uh, Mm. irony of irony at the state armory where they brought served as a a morgue. Mm. And um, I think, too, because of that. It was always sold out. Every year when the circus came to town, you couldn't get a ticket at the door. It's just we had – it was like you had to do it. You had to understand how this could have happened. And when I was a little girl, my my father took me every year. I'm sure that's why I became a feminist, to see what the circus performers, the women did mm-hmm. that men didn't do, mm-hmm. like this recent accident in Providence, these women hanging by their hair at the peak of the tent. Just moments ago, she said how this could have happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are really uh, key words, and they go to the heart of what caused it as well as how it could have happened. I know you were interested in going in yeah, that direction. B- before we get to that, I just wanted to ask Marianne one more question about this because, I mean, um, because we're friends, I know about this. Maybe it may not be your favorite thing to talk about for all I know. You had an episode a few years ago where you had kind of a brush with – what felt like a brush with death, right? Um, a traffic light fell down. Last October. It was last October. Okay. Yeah. Did that – and, and you, you really did feel quite, you know, as though you had escaped death. Like the fire. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you made any connections between those two. Or I, whether you're sh- I them sure them. did. Circus tents aren't supposed to burn down with all the people in them. The traffic light over your head is not supposed to fall and miss you by – three inches, followed by snaking live wires and cables Mm. scraping across my car. And I only knew one thing. I wanted to get out of there. Mm. I don't know how I drove the car on this cup, let me leave. I said, I have to go home. I just have to go home. That was my uncle, who was a fireman. I mean, he'd been at fires, and he couldn't take it in. This was just not supposed to happen. And, yeah, so life is that way sometimes. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about what uh, Don's bringing up here. But, uh, Gary, maybe set the scene for us a little bit. The the initial version of events, the initial understanding, which seemed to be kind of accepted by everybody, was that this was an accident. And to the extent that anybody was taking the blame for it, the circus was taking the blame, right? Yes. Uh, in that same attitude that the show got back on the road following the recent accident in Rhode Island, uh, the show knows uh, that the the way to— take care of this uh, accident and pay claims that are inevitable is to get the show back on the road. If the show's not on the road, the claims are never going to be paid. 
it's just a given in the in the circus world that there's no question that there will be a show the next day. Um, After the Wallendas fell. That's correct. Immediately. Yeah. Yes. So, the, uh, the, the Wallenda Here. accident in Detroit back in the 60s, the fire in 1944, the recent accident in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, it's absolutely a given among show people that the show must go on. I'm also wondering whether the moment had something to do with this. Uh, in other words, we're, we're still fighting World War II. I'm wondering if maybe there was sort of a sense of everything has to keep going. We can't stop time and investigate this down to the last scintilla. Everything has to keep going. We're in the middle of our great war. That's right. Today, you know, when there's a disaster like this, uh, we, we bring in all the, uh, the experts to help with the, uh, with the stress. The mayor of Hartford, a few days after the fire, it's so many examples of people trying to take this in. And he said, we lost more people on the day of the fire than all of New England lost on D-Day. Before we run out of time, I do want to talk a little bit about the understanding of what happened. In Marianne's book, uh, the protagonist or one of the protagonists is this fire investigator who's doing everything he can to try to figure out what actually happened. Was this an accident? Was it arson? And, Don, that's been very much the thrust of your efforts as well. What was this? What was this fire? Um, It was recorded initially as an accident. I know you don't think it was. No, I absolutely reject the premise of accident, as uh, subsequent investigators did. The declaration of accidental ignition had as much to do with risk financially and otherwise to the city as it did to the facts later uncovered. The tunnel vision assessment made by Fire Commissioner, Police Commissioner Edward Hickey at the time, that a cigarette had been thrown into the sawdust over the grass and therefore had ignited the tent, was something that had been said to him in an offhanded fashion by a police officer. For those people who doubt that cigarettes are routinely tossed into the sawdust of a circus, that can easily be dispelled. The uh, investigation conducted by Rick Davey went to the issues of climate, humidity, and temperature at the time of the fire. It was 88 degrees and almost 50% humidity. In recent years, FBI analyses of those kinds of conditions as they relate to the possible accidental ignition of grass and, by extension, this particular tent, it is inconceivable that those conditions would allow for grass to ignite. In other words, you've got to create, uh, for this to be the case, a pretty powerful fire on the ground because the flammable part of the tent isn't what's near the ground, right? The flammable stuff is, is, is way up. Yes, the, the sidewall does not have that weatherproofing compound. It's not necessary. So, Don Massey, one of the people who, who, who emerged, I think around 1950, was that it? This guy, Robert Segi. Uh, you can yeah. pick up the story there. Robert Dale Segi was a New England-born, longtime youthful arsonist, a juvenile fire setter with a long, long, subsequently discovered history of deliberate arson. He was captured on the basis of a tip in May of 1950 in Circleville, Ohio. When questioned by the authorities there, he willingly and in great detail confessed to all the crimes he committed in New England and was not the least reticent about describing the circumstances of his participation and membership in the circus crew and his willingness to uh, set the fire here in Hartford. And he explained how he did it. What is little known is that Offhandedly, he explained, and it wasn't really part of a confession that was revealed to the state of Connecticut, he indicated that the fire he set was in the men's room tent, directly outside but contiguous to the main entrance of the tent flaps that led inside the big top. He confessed, and all authorities in Ohio believed his confession. They actually sent an investigator from Ohio all the way through the New England states to research the background of his arsons and crimes. All of that data was confirmed in New England. But there was an active cover-up, because what's intriguing here is that long before there was Watergate and Richard Nixon, the Connecticut Police Commissioner, Edward Hickey, recorded all of his phone calls, and those phone calls were transcribed. We have those transcriptions wherein in one of them, he orders the Ohio Fire Marshal Harry Callan to prevent 
any of his investigators from coming to Connecticut to investigate the blaze. This was an active, secret cover-up in which two detectives from Hartford were sent to Ohio to investigate C.G. They threatened him with extradition and punishment, and all of the strides made in C.G.'s relationship with the psychiatrist were destroyed by these Eastern authorities. It is a massive and deliberate cover-up to conceal the municipal negligence that led to forcing Ringling to accept a plea bargain as opposed to go to trial and send six men to Wethersfield State Prison. Gary Payne, I'm going to ask you about this um, because it seems to me that the most powerful interest in all of this at the moment was Ringling Brothers, the circus. I mean, they were a huge entertainment company. They would have a very pressing interest in not covering this up. In other words, they don't want people to think that it's fundamentally, intrinsically dangerous to go to the circus. It's only dangerous that there's some kind of maniac around actively setting fires. So I'm kind of wondering, I mean, do you, do you believe that there was a cover-up? It would seem to me that there would be some pretty powerful people who would want the story, who would want to be able to blame a maniac for this, as opposed to municipal negligence or flammable tent tops. I think you have to understand how quickly this all uh, took place following the actual fire on July 6th. Uh, Within a matter of a couple of days, it became obvious to local authorities that the circus would accept full responsibility and pay all claims. Uh, That was a pretty darn good deal for a city and state that were looking at uh, the possibility of sharing liability. Uh, So when the circus signed off on it, for the city of Hartford and the state of Connecticut, it was a good deal. And the show got what it wanted, which was to be back on the road as quickly as possible to uh, maintain that show-must-go-on attitude. And uh, it worked to the benefit of those who were injured in terms of paying those claims. Mary and Tyrone Smith, I'm so hesitant to introduce a spoiler into your book. Are we allowed to say what actually? No. <laughs> no, okay. Absolutely not. Then forget about it. Then forget about it. Um, that was my theory. What yeah. happened in my book is, to, is the theory that I had what happened. My, my uncle said the few days later, a bunch of firemen went in a field and tried to set a piece of canvas on fire, in the grass. He said, you could have do it. And, and might I, could I just um, say, right, honor my mm-hmm. uncle, who next year will be 100 years old, wow. Norbert Delaurier, who's lived in Hartford all his life. Still does. <laughs> Donna, well, Don, I'm going to direct my question back at you. So it seems to me that in a situation like this, what you really like to have usually is a patsy, to use the Lee Harvey Oswald term. The city doesn't want to take the blame for its the negligence that you've described. Ringling Brothers, they don't want anybody thinking it's intrinsically dangerous to go to the circus. So C- CG are, it seems like the perfect guy to say, no, it wasn't Hartford, and it wasn't the people who run the circus. It was this one lone maniac. It's all his fault. Why cover up his involvement? Right. Absolutely right. And that is the essence of my book and my screenplay, which will soon be made into a major motion picture. Actually, Marianne's book has been optioned, too. There may be a lot of movies about the Hartford Circus Fire so. uh, coming out. But what, what would be anybody's incentive to cover up this guy? He's the perfect answer for everybody's most cynical purposes. Well, first of all, we have to assume that, and the circus actually published this, even in 1944, they made assertions that this, uh, this fire was set. And none of the investigative authorities accepted that, gave it credence. James Haley, who uh, is the only man who spent a year in Wethersfield Prison, was married into the Ringling family and was the traveling manager of the circus. He never let anyone, including his family members, come to the Wethersfield State Prison to see him. So humiliated was he by this circumstance. The only person who ever came to see him was Edward Rogin the man who orchestrated the the means by which, A, there would be a plea bargain, B, there would be concealment of facts, and C, there would be $15 million negotiated payouts for six years up until the very month that Robert Dale C.G. was arrested in Ohio. They were making their last payment just as he was arrested. There could not be a trial because if there were a trial, there would be a defense, and a defense would put C.G. forward as a damaged arsonist And therefore, the circus would be as much victim as the city, thereby going to Gary's point about the mandated shared liability that would ultimately come of this. So they wanted it to be an accident. The city wanted it to be declared an accident because they wanted to be able to plea bargain this thing out, and they did. And I am the only human being who ever interviewed Eddie Rogen in his office about a year before he died. And wearing his olive drab suit, he told me, There was one visitor to James Haley 
on December 24th, 1945, the very day that Haley was packing to go home to Florida after his year of imprisonment was over. And that man was not Ed Roger. It was Judge Shea, who was the man who put these people in prison. And Judge Shea was unkempt, disheveled, the scent of alcohol on his breath, and he entered the warden's ante room and sought in tears for Haley's forgiveness mm -hmm. for what had been done to him and the circus. This was a deal in the making because they never presented their certificate of insurance in advance, only after the fact. A bribe was paid, a permit was given, and the negligence led to the worst possible consequences of this place. Mary and Tyron Smith, I'm going to let you have the last word here. Uh, we're kind of running out of time, but I feel like we're going to have another conversation about this in 10 years and 10 years and in 10 years. You know, that this, all the things that he's saying, all the things that have been said here makes me think this is a permanent story, and it's to a certain degree an, a, a permanent scar that never quite, he, quite heals. Everybody keeps saying there's so much to it and so much meaning to it. I don't think Sagi or Sagi, however you say his name, did it. I think he was a psychopath, sociopath who would have confessed to anything. So there was a real risk in arresting this guy and bringing him to trial because they knew he could have said, I kidnapped the Lindbergh baby. I mean, he was really a looney tune. So, yes, there is evidence that he could have well been the one to do it. But to have this trial, which would have been all over the world, and have this crackpot saying, God only knows what— I think whoever set this fire, and I believe it was arson, could have been any number of people. And I have a couple of theories about it. But just because of that, the story is going to go on and on. Who said it and why did he set it? Or she said it and why did she set it? It will st still keep going. But to me, the most remarkable thing is the Ringling brother Barnum and Bailey officers who went to prison. When the Ford Pinto engine caught fire... Nobody went to prison, even though people knew, the actuaries knew, the cars would catch fire, people would die, and people would be injured. Now, we don't learn from history. This has just happened again, and you've got the with head of General, General, General Motors. Motors yeah. You've got her, the head of General Motors saying, we're going to change the culture. We're going to see that these things don't happen. Well, wait a minute. What about the guys who knew it was going to happen? I'm, I'm ready to go make a citizen's arrest after this circus fire. Those guys... You know, they didn't serve life terms. It was a negligent homicide. You can't put that stuff on a circus tent and think there's no risk. So just but, that but, reason but, along this right. alone, will, this will go on but and on and on. But people did go to prison. Uh, interesting point. Uh, and people don't anymore. Mm -mm. All right. We're going to end there. Uh, thanks very much to Gary Payne from the uh, Circus Fans Association, Don Massey from A Matter of Degree, Marianne Tyrone Smith, author of Masters of Illusions, and uh, thanks to Kion Wolf for putting this show together. We'll be back tomorrow. Get the buckets, boys. There's danger here today. Mystery remain with it lives the memory of thirty minutes turned to eternity in Hartford the day the circus came to town in Hartford the day the circus burned down.